you open your Bibles, please, at Romans 4 and verses 13 through 15, and it's page 980, and uh, you could see there the verses that we have been studying these two Sundays, last Sunday and this Sunday, Romans 4 and verses 13 through 15. The promise to Abraham and his descendants that they should inherit the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Have you ever told a lie? And then you're caught out in it. And you know that the immediate reaction of our old human nature is to try to prove that we had a very, very good reason for telling that lie. And we're convinced in our own minds that, okay, it may be wrong. On the highest level of morality, it may be wrong. But I had really a very good reason for telling it. And the, the whole response of the human nature is, okay, let's explain to them why we told that lie. And it's just us. You know, we just immediately want to justify ourselves. We miss an assignment, we know it's through laziness and indolence, or because we went to a party, or because we didn't bother with doing the work, but when the lecturer catches us, the old human nature wants to justify and rationalize and excuse. And that's the attitude we often have to the Creator. We know we're really feel very insecure in this spinning world. And it's really because we have no idea of who the Creator is or what His attitude to us is. But our own tendency is always to justify ourselves. Instead of getting in touch with Him and finding out what He's like and what He thinks of us, our own tendency is to establish our self-righteousness in some way. And the normal way we do it is we try to become the kinds of people that He could not possibly reject. We just try to become those people that he couldn't possibly reject. We're so good, and we abide by so many laws, and we are so self-righteous, and we have so many good reasons for the things we do. And really, brothers and sisters, a lot of us get into the confusion in our own minds because instead of ever dealing with the Creator, we're always trying to persuade ourselves and everybody else that we really are very righteous people, and there's no reason on earth why a Creator who's at all fair or just would possibly reject us or make us feel insecure. Now, you know that last Sunday we saw that that isn't the way to get secure with your Creator or to get right with your Creator. That righteousness is being right with God. It isn't establishing your own morality. It is getting right with God in the way He wants you to get right with Him. And that we saw last Sunday was through trust. You start trusting your Creator. You start treating Him as though He is your own loving Father. And as if He's concerned about every hair of your head as He is about the Milky Way. And you just start trusting your God and start trusting Him as your Father. And you remember what we said, that faith or that trust God regards as righteousness. And he looks maybe upon your morality, maybe it's not good, but he looks on your trust of him, and he knows that sooner or later, if you keep trusting him, you're going to become the kinds of people that he will be proud of, and so he makes you right with himself, and he treats your faith as if it were righteousness. In other words, he makes you right with himself through your trusting him. Do you remember that last Sunday we talked about what you trust? You trust his promises. God, the creator who has never broken his word down through centuries, gives certain promises to us men and women. And if we trust those promises, God makes us right with himself. Trusting the promises means not only saying, oh yeah, I trust. I trust that that side of the stage will not fall down when I step on it. But will I step on it? No, but I trust it. Yeah, I trust it absolutely, but I'm not going to try it. But trusting is really doing that. And trusting is really stepping out on what you know he has promised he'll do for you. 
I think a, a lot of us, you see, would get free from a great deal of striving and straining and trying to prove ourselves to our Creator and trying to justify him, ourselves to Him by being good if we would trust His promises. If we would sort of lie back and just, just breathe at last and just accept that what He has promised is actually going to come true. Now, you know, those promises are very plain if, you, if you'd like to. Romans 5 and 9, just that same page in the Bible, 980. Romans 5 and 9 is one of those promises. Since, therefore, we are now justified by his blood, by Jesus' blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And God has given us that promise. And you can either keep trying to prove yourself to your husbands and your wives, or you can try to keep justifying yourself to your parents, or you try, can try, keep trying to prove to yourself that you're really a very good person in spite of the kind of life you live, or you can trust that you're justified by the blood of Jesus, that God actually has nothing against you at this moment. And he's certainly reconciled to you as far as he is concerned, because Jesus has died to pay the debt that you owed to God's law of justice. And the moment you trust that promise, that moment there just comes a great sense of rightness with God. And then God is able to give you his spirit, which produces a dynamic, a moral dynamic in your life. But you see, it's trusting the promises of God. Or, you know, there's another one there in Romans 3 and 24 and 25. Romans 3 and 24. They are justified by his grace as a gift. You don't need to justify yourself by trying hard or proving that you're good, but as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. And that just explains that you should die because you're not good and that Jesus has died in your place and so God is justified in forgiving you and God is willing to forgive you. And loved ones, those of us who are going around our campuses with a chip on our shoulders, always trying to prove ourselves to somebody, always trying to strive and strain and justify ourselves in other people's eyes and rationalize away our wrongs, what God is saying is, look, would you stop all that charade? Would you stop playing around? I know what you are, and despite that, I love you, and I've forgiven you because of my son Jesus. Would you stop pretending that you're not a sinner and start telling me the things that you've done wrong and let's get them out of your life? And that's the father's attitude, loved ones. You see, Calvary is really the father holding his hand up to guard his face from the effects of our sin, and you can see the marks on his hands and the marks of Jesus' hand, and Calvary is his other hand reaching out and saying, come on, I want you. I'll want you. But it's him that wants us. And trusting God is the method by which God establishes our rightness with himself. And so we need to just trust God. We see, of course, that if you begin to trust his promises in all areas of life, it saves you from works of law. Works of law are doing what everybody is telling you you ought to do to please somebody else or to get some result. So, I mean, for years, I was like that woman, you remember, that had the hemorrhage, you know. Hey, well, you can look at it if you like to. Uh, it's in uh, Mark 5 and verses 25 and 29. And this works, you see, in every part of life. This, if you trust God, his promises are made real to you, but only if you trust him. His promises don't become real to people who are trying by works of law to prove themselves or justify themselves or get certain results. But those who trust him, Mark 5 and 25. And, the, and there was a woman in the crowd, you remember. It's page 871. Uh, 871. And there was a woman who had had a flow of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians. That's you, physician. And had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. And I, I had often been in that situation, and I think some of you have been. 
She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I shall be made well. And immediately the hemorrhage ceased and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now, I was certainly like that in my own physical life. And I was trying to do all the things that I could read that I should do to keep this sickness away. And then at last, I trusted what the psalmist said, that bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgiveth all your iniquities, who healeth all your diseases. And I saw that that was a promise that God had given me, that he would heal my disease. And I stopped striving and straining and obeying all the things that I was trying to obey to get rid of the sickness, and I trusted God, and the promise was made real. But you see, brothers and sisters, the promises of God are made real to people who are right with God through faith, not to people who are striving and straining all the time. Now, that should be what the verses say that we looked at today, and maybe you just look at it again now we've said that. It's Romans chapter 4 and verse 13. Romans 4 and 13. It's page 980. The promise to Abraham and his descendants that they should inherit the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And that's what God is saying. And then you see in verse 14, he says, if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, that's if it's to be the Jews who are obeying all the, the works of the law, and who are not exercising the faith and trust that the Abraham their father has, then faith is null and the promise is void. You can't inherit and come into the reality of the promises of God through works of law and through faith. It's either through one or the other. And then the question comes, you know, okay, what's the big deal with the law? What is the purpose of the law? Why did God give us the law at all if it's through faith that the promises are made real? And do you see in the next verse, what God says the law does. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the purpose of the law is to bring wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Now, does that mean that the law is bad? We come back to that verse in a moment. But does that mean that the law is bad, that we should ignore the law, that we should despise the law, that we should cut the law apart and say that's the Old Testament dispensation. You don't bother with the law now. We're living by faith and trust in God. Well, that is not what God's word says. Romans 7 and 12. Romans 7 and 12. It's 982. Romans 7 and 12. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. No, God's word doesn't say the law is bad. How then does the law bring wrath? Well, this way. The law says, I'm going to describe to you the life of a man who trusts God implicitly. A man who trusts God implicitly will have no other gods before God the Father of Jesus. A man who loves God implicitly will not commit adultery. A man who trusts God completely will never steal. A man who trusts God completely will not covet anything that is his neighbor's. A man who trusts God completely will not bear false witness against his neighbor. In other words, the law reveals to us what the life of a man who trusts God is like so that we come to the law and we see, ah, I have that kind of life, so I know I trust God. Or I have not that kind of life, so I know I don't trust God. But the purpose of the law is to bring to our consciousness the fact of whether we're trusting God or not trusting God. That's its purpose, brothers and sisters. It is not to make us right with God. It is not that we may try to obey the law in every, in every little issue and therefore please God. The law is there 
to examine our lives in absolute detail to bring home to us whether we're trusting God or not. Otherwise, you see what we do. You know us human beings. We say, you make yourself right with God by trusting him. We say, oh yeah, I'm trusting God, trusting God, yeah, inside in my heart, I'm trusting him like mad. Really I am, may not look like it, but I'm trusting God. Yeah, trust God, that's what we do, trust in the Lord and don't despair. And we just wander around in generalities and vagueness, and we say, yeah, are you a Christian? Yeah, yeah, I trust God. And, you know, we wouldn't know whether we trusted God or not. Now, God has given us the law to describe the life of a man who trusts him completely. But that law is not something that we should strive to obey. But it is a diagnostic tool that will set before us plainly whether we're trusting God or not. And that will, in fact, drive us back to God. Now, you can see that if you look at Romans 7 and verses 7 through 8. Romans 7 and verses 7 through 8. What then shall we say? that the law is sin by no means yet if it had not been for the law I should not have known sin that is I should not have recognized it sin is not trusting God let's get away from that deal you know that sin is drinking too much alcohol or sin is swearing that is a sin but sin deep down the attitude that is sin is a lack of trust in God now what Paul is saying is I should not have recognized sin within me. I should not have been able to see that I wasn't trusting God if it hadn't been for the law. I should not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. I'd have gone on coveting and I wouldn't have been trusting God, but I'd have made coveting the norm for my race. And that was the situation with us men and women. We had got so far away from trusting God or depending on him that we had made the norm what a distrusting man would have in his own life. But it was only when the law came that we saw this is a life that does not trust God. In verse 8, But sin, finding opportunity in the commandment, wrought in me all kinds of covetousness. In other words, the lack of trust that I had in God brought all kinds of covetousness out in my life. The law showed me that that was covetousness, showed me that therefore I wasn't trusting God. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. And brothers and sisters, we could live a life the trusting only ourselves and depending only on ourselves and we would never know it if it weren't for the law apart from the law sin lies dead I was once alive apart from the law but when the commandment came sin revived and I died and so it is you know a brother or sister who does not respect his conscience or does not respect the law whatever it is a Hindu law or Mohammedan law or the law of God that person will be very very happy some people say, uh, oh, the way I know I'm a Christian is that uh, I'm content and quiet and satisfied. And I remember John Wesley said, so is a car chewing grass in the field. And, <laughs> and so it is, you see, with a non-Christian, with a person who doesn't know any law and doesn't bother with the law. That person is really very happy. And he doesn't know that he's not trusting his God and will never know until he eventually meets him face to face at the last day. But the purpose of the law is to expose our lack of trust in God to us. It exposes sin to us, which is a lack of trust in God. And you see what the verse says that we're studying this morning in Romans 4 and 15b. Romans 4 and 15b, page 980. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. And that's true. If there were no law, we would never know we weren't trusting God. We would, never know, we would never know we weren't pleasing Him. And where there is no law, nobody knows they're doing wrong. And above all, sin, distrust in God, rebellion against God, lies hidden and unrecognized. But it's still there. And it's still, still going to destroy at the last day. Because it's that lack of trust in God that present, prevents Him giving you supernatural, eternal, uncreated life. And without that trust, he cannot give you that life. And without that life, you will die at the end of this life and go into outer darkness. And you see, you never know any of that unless there's a law. My wife said that she's glad we got a dog because it takes the illustrations away from her. So, they... <laughs> sure, she's miserably embarrassed. Yeah, she is. Yeah. So, uh, we have a little dog, little Yorkshire. I told you about it. And he's that size, you know, a miserable little soul. 
And, <laughs> and at the beginning, I think he's six months old. And uh, at the beginning, when he, we've had him, I think, about a month now. And at the beginning, uh, uh, my wife would call him and he would go trotting over to her. And it uh, seemed, boy, he was really very obedient, you know. She'd go just when, when uh, he'd go just when she called him. And uh, I would call him once or twice, and sometimes he would come and sometimes he wouldn't, but I thought, well, that isn't important. I mean, she gives him the food, that's why. And uh, then it began to come home to me, but he has a little miserable rebellious will that really we're just allowing to develop and lie there. And so I began to try to teach him obedience. And I got the lead, you know, and said, okay, Shu is his name. Shu, you know, it's a wild name. C-H-O-U-X. It's a French for uh, cabbage. And it's what a lover. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, don't marry Irish ladies. Tell you what. When a French boyfriend loves his girlfriend, he says, Mon chou, je vous aime. I say, my, my cabbage, I love you. I'm sure we have. <laughs> so we call him Shu. And I would pull the old lead and say, Shu. And he would stand there and wouldn't move, you know. And you could see the rebellion in his eyes. And I'd haul him again. And he wouldn't move. And loved ones, really, the old independence and rebellion was there, but it never came out until I began to give him some commandments, you know? And it was lying there all the time. And I think many of us do this, you know, with old Spock's help. I think many of us do this with our children. We let the old rebellion and independence lie there, and we never really bring it out or expose it by ever telling them to do anything. And it was only when commandment began to come that I began to see that the little animal wasn't obedient at all. He was just doing what suited him. He just went to the person that he wanted to go to at that time. Now, do you see that that's the purpose of the law? When Jesus says to us, don't commit adultery, and we commit adultery, either in physical, with our physical bodies, or by looking onto a woman to lust after her, then Jesus is exposing to us that there you are not trusting me for your sexual life. You're not trusting me. You're not trusting that I will give you whatever satisfaction you need in that part of your life. You're grabbing for it on your own because basically you don't trust that I and my Father know that side of your life and will fulfill it for you in just the degree that will be right. That's the importance of the law. God comes along and says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. We find ourselves committing adultery either in our minds or in our bodies, what are we to do? We're to go to God and trust them more. Do you see that? Not we're to go and by sheer willpower try to obey the law, but we're to allow the law to drive us back to God, to expose before us our lack of trust in him. The law says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We find ourselves bearing false witness. We find ourselves talking about our neighbors, gossiping about them, criticizing them. What God wants to show us is, listen, you're not trusting God for your own status or your own reputation. That's why you're spending all this time running down everybody else to build yourself up, bearing false witness against your neighbors, criticizing them in order to show how good you are, because you're not trusting me that I will establish your status. I will establish your reputation. You're not trusting me to give you a reputation and status that is right for you. And again and again, you see, faith is to make us right with God. And the purpose of the law is to expose our lack of faith and to drive us to trust in God more. Not to drive us to trying to obey that law for its own sake, but to drive us back to God, to trust him so much that that law will never be able to expose any lack of trust in it again. So it is with stealing. Thou shalt not steal. And if you find yourself stealing, it's God saying to you, look, you don't trust me to give you all you need. Or you disagree with me about what your needs are. But that's why you're stealing. That's why you're stealing other people's reputation. That's why you're stealing little things. Because deep down in yourself, you don't trust me to give you all that you need. That's why you covet. You're coveting what other people have because you're not trusting my promise 
that I will supply every need of yours for my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But do you see, brothers and sisters, the response that the Father expects is a greater trust in him. Now you see the great danger. The great danger is when we come to spiritual laws that we will not see them in the same light. And so the Father has been teaching some of us in the evenings that you are to witness not in your emotions, and not just with your brilliant intellect, but you're to witness in your spirit. And Jesus has taught us certain laws of the spiritual life. Now, if you find yourself suddenly witnessing in your emotions, God does not expect you to say, I'm going to get hold and obey this law. I'm going to obey it. I'm going to witness in my spirit and not in my emotions. No. The spiritual law is to drive you into a deeper relationship with Jesus, to trust him more, so that there will come a time when you will be able to witness in your spirit without any difficulty. Spiritual law, you remember, is that you love your neighbors, you love your dear ones in the dormitories or in the classrooms. You love them as yourself. You love them with an unselfish love. You love them for Jesus' sake. And you find yourself not able to love them with that love then God doesn't want you to try to get hold of your emotions and say, I must love them the right way. I must love them the right way. Do you see you're coming back under the law when you do that? What Jesus wants you to say is, Lord Jesus, there must be some way in which I am not trusting you completely in relationship to my friends. Now, I want to trust you completely. Will you give me revelation through the Holy Spirit so that I can trust you more completely, so that I'll be able to love my friends with the love that you want me to love them. But brothers and sisters, do you see that the law then is a dear friend? The law is a dear friend to all of us who are children of God. That's why the Bible so often talks about loving God's law and meditating in it day and night. Brothers and sisters, I tell you, I love, I love God's law even when it shows me completely that I'm not like him at all. That's precious. That is God's diagnostic tool going to work and showing you're not trusting the Father deeply enough. Ask the Holy Spirit for revelation. But do you see, the purpose of faith is to make us right with God. The purpose of the law is to expose our lack of faith. The answer to the law is a greater exercise of faith and trust. And from that will flow a natural obedience. But that's the way God wants us to deal. And the important thing is, you know, really, I know this is heresy, but the important thing is not the drinking, you know, or what all the other things that we're supposed to do, or even the drugs, you know. That is not the important thing. The important thing is that those things reflect an utter lack of trust in your God, an utter distrust of your Father in heaven, and therefore a great illogicality. If he supplied all that we see around us, and yet you still won't trust him for this little part of your life, then there is a great lack of reason in your life as well as a lack of real faith. But that's the purpose of the law. So, you know, I'd say to you this morning, do you find that the law convicts you somewhere in your life? Do you sense somewhere this morning where you're not obeying the law? Well, now, that's God showing you that you don't trust him enough. And if you ask the Holy Spirit, he can nail that down to a particular in your life. And you can enter into a, a greater release and freedom through the revelation that the law gives you. So, could we begin to look upon it as a dear friend? You know, I can't get this business where Christians say, oh, I'm free from the law. You know, don't, it doesn't matter what I do. It seems to me the law is a dear friend to tell us when we're not trusting our Father. And we're expected to love it and respect it, and respond to it with trust, not with that old gritted teeth and the old willpower, but really just with a trust of our Father. And you can't trust him, really. And he'll keep his promises with you. He won't destroy his own nature just to let you down, really. He loves his own nature, and he wants to remain consistent, and he'll keep his promises with you. I, I don't know what your need is, you know. Some of you may be sick this morning. Or some of you may have a relationship at home that is just pitiful and miserable and tearing you apart. You see that God wants you to trust him about that? 
to start trusting him and acting on the basis of that trust. If you want me to tie it down, at home it usually means that you stop getting your sleeves up and getting into the thing and trying to put your dad right, your mom right, the brother right, the sister right, your dorm mate right, everybody else right. And you start trusting God and saying, Father, I trust you to bring about a change in them and I'm just going to love them. And with the old examinations, you know, it means you start, stop trying to worry the consequences into A instead of D minus. You stop trying to worry the consequences and the results of the exam into the right category and you begin to, Father, I trust you with this. And I'm going to do my best, but I trust you with the results. But trusting the Father is retreating from that front line and letting him take over the front line and you begin trusting and living in that. And it's really a good way to fly, you know. It's really the only way to go. It really is. And it's the Father's plan. Father doesn't plan for us all to be walking around and strain and worry, striving and straining. That isn't his plan for us, is it? Filling the psych wards uh, and, and running out of all kinds of drugs in order to get ourselves relaxed, that isn't the Father's will. The sun doesn't strain too much from what we can see to get up in the morning, probably because we're turning and it's not getting up. But the Father's world goes naturally. Look at the flowers of the field. They toil not, neither do they reap. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now God expects us to trust him as our loving father. And then to do things not to get money, but because he's told us to do them. So it doesn't result, you see, in a world of irresponsible. Because we still do the things, but we do them because he's told us. Not in order to get the things we need. And really, it's his plan for us. So I do pray that, because I know it's easy to listen to this stuff each Sunday, and it re really what you need is revelation, you know? I really feel for you, because I can't talk to you individually, and I, I'd love to. But really, loved ones, it's for you, you know, individually. The Father can work this kind of life in you, if you start trusting him, and stop just trusting your great self all the time. The Father will make it real for you, honestly, he will. You know, whatever the old strain is or the old difficulty the father can work it if you begin to trust him if you're sitting there with an all intellectual mess you know I was in that same state brother or sister you can trust him you can stand back from the intellectual mess and say father I'm not going to stop thinking but I'm going to trust that your truth is deeper than I can see with my finite mind and I'm going to move out on the steps that you've shown me and then I believe that insight will come from that trust and it will. Well, if, if you, you know, if I can help you in any way, would you be really free to come down? A, a few of us stay around afterwards down here and really just come down, you know, and, and we can talk or, or pray if it helps you. Yeah. But uh, really enter into it. Don't just listen. Yeah. Father, we thank you that from all that we can see with our own eyes, you do manage mighty movements of planets and galaxies. And you do take care of things that are far too big for us. And yet, Father, by some deception, we have again and again thought that only we can run our own lives. And only we can sort out these business problems or these school problems. Father, we believe you are able to do that. And we would declare now, our Father, that we're willing to trust you. Lord, we don't know all the ins and outs of becoming a Christian or getting rid of our sins, but we believe the first step is to begin to trust what you have said, that we're justified by the blood of Jesus, and that you have nothing against us, and that you are reconciled to us, and that we will only trust your promise you will give us your spirit of life to transform our own moral lives. So, Father, we would tell you this morning that we intend to trust you from this day forward. And we intend to make it evident in our lives that we are trusting. Father, if we're involved with the tranquilizers or with some kind of drugs to keep the emotions quiet, 
Lord, we are ready to take a step there. We are ready to begin trusting you, to fill us with the peace of Jesus. And we're prepared to throw away those things. And we're prepared to begin to walk as we believe. For your glory. Amen.